Okay. Dove, are we starting? Yeah, we're good to go. Thank you so much. Well, okay, take care. So I guess you're, you're, you're leaving me now. I'm going to listen along. Oh, you are? Wow, what it covered. Okay, um, um, I guess it's evening by me, must be afternoon by you. Shalom Aleichem. It's been a while. Uh, a pleasure learning with you and teaching with you. Um, I still have great memories of the Atlanta Beth Jacob community. You should only be zayich to continue being a harbatist tyre. It's a beautiful thing, and we should always, always have the pleasure of doing this together. Well, the uh, bracha that I am um, have been invited to teach is the bracha of Ashivenu Avinu Lesarosecha. God, bring us back to your Torah. The Korvenu Malkenu, and let our our King please uh, bring us close. Lavadasecha to your service. Actually, it means to your servitude. And thus bring us back with total returning. That's what it means. In front of you. I'd like to understand what those things mean. What does it mean that you ask God to uh, bring you back to his Torah? Then bring him close to his servitude. Ultimately, bring you back with total return to him. The obvious question that starts here, what does it mean here when we use the word Torah and then Avodah? Reminds me of my days in the Akiva, which that Avodah then meant I'm um, picking up oranges in some kibbutz. But we also understand that when we talk about Torah and Avodah in the um, in the Siddur, we're talking about Torah means the Limud HaTayra, the knowledge, the information given, the internalization, understanding, and the internalization of the knowledge of the Torah. And then ultimately, the um, uh, avoda means the servitude, literally something which is constantly, um, I think, misinterpreted. They uh, interpret it as service. Uh, we are not in service of God. We are servants of God. God is our king. He's not our employer. Uh, we are actually slaves. Something not simple to, uh, to hear or to internalize. It means to say we are totally enslaved to him. Our will is his, and uh, and our and, and our life is 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 his to take and to give. I'd like to understand that too. But whatever it is, we're talking about God. Take us back to your Torah and ultimate to the knowledge, and ultimately bring back to your service. And through that, we will stand and be close to you. By somehow getting close to your knowledge and getting close to your service, we'll finally stand up upright in front of you, yourself. You know, there's an old question asked, and that is, um, you know, if tshuva is a mitzvah, something which we're expected to do, thus we have free will to choose to do it or not, why would it be that we ask God to intervene in our free will and please bring us to the tshuva? I thought it's supposed to be our mitzvah. We're supposed to be doing this. Do you ask God, please uh, make, uh, I don't know what, help me write a mezuzah? <laughs> uh, please uh, make sure my tefillin are kosher tomorrow. Do you pray for that? Do you pray for any other mitzvot that you're going to please let me help me or make sure I'm fulfilling the mitzvah? Because you want this mitzvah, I suggest we say, uh, I know, make sure we put on tefillin, Baruch to Hashem, tefillin, blessed are you the Lord that wants tefillin to be put on the arm and on the head. Or bless you the Lord uh, that, that wants kashrut, so therefore we should help us, please make sure that we do kashrut. We obviously don't bless for God's inter we don't pray for God's intervention in our free will. We don't pray for God, please to wait to make sure it happens, and whether we do or don't want to. No, we our, our job is to want it. What exactly is this prayer when we talk about tshuva? What is this prayer? Well, to understand that, I'd like to start from, from like from, from the very beginnings of things and uh, to understand what exactly is this shuva and where it comes from, and ultimately trying to understand what is this mitzvah and thus where is the place of asking God's intervention. Well, the pasuk starts in Dvarim, in chapter Deuteronomy, chapter thirty. Let me find it for a moment. Yes, verse three. 
where the Pasuk says over there, Vaya, it will come to place, Ki when all these things that I mentioned, birth of blessings and the curses that were mentioned, blessings when we adhere to the will of God, and the curses and the tragedies which occur to us when we are wayward and walk away from the will of God, both the blessing and the cursings, the curses, which I had presented in front of you and told you, these are your options, um, choose. When these things finally occur, you take things to heart. You translate cerebral knowledge into emotional intelligence. You will bring it to your heart. You will take it, you will internalize it. It will become vivid and real, not just some theoretical, theological idea. Wherever you be amongst all those nations which God had dispersed you between them, you will suddenly take your religion to heart. At that point of time, Vishafta Ad Yudke Vavke and Lokecha, you will then return to Hashem, which is written here with the letters Yud, He, and Vav and He, which we will explain. And Lokecha, your Lord. You will return to God, your Lord. Vishamata Bekolo, you will adhere uh, to his voice equals, as we know in Ramban, it means you will hear what his voice has to say. Like all the things which I command you today. If you do this seriously, you've internalized it, and you will listen not just to the words, but what the words have to say, then it'll be, you will hear this, and your children will also hear this. You will hear this with your total heart, equals with your total emotional involvement, with your total emotional intelligence, with your all sense of self. Nefesh means soul, it means living soul. Nefesh actually means that expression of the soul, which is expressed in being a living organism. You will, under, you, under tragedy and under the duress, you will then take this all to heart. At that point in time, you will hear it and then see it and hear the music, not just you, but your children, Totally and with your whole sense of self. At that point of time, the Shav Hashem is then that God will bring back, God the Lord will bring back those remnants of you which after can be brought back, equals back to Israel, back out of Galut. And he will actually have a he will have mercy upon you. The Shav he will return, he will he will gather you from all the nations. Hashem, Hashem, where God, your Lord, had thrown you asunder. Shama, there you are. The scribes, should you you're far flung, be at the end of the heavens. God will bring you back, your Lord. He will take you from wherever you are. God, the Lord, will bring you to that land which your forefathers had inherited and you will finally realize your inheritance. He will do good to you. One more pasuk. At that stage in history, God your Lord will, so to speak, take off the callous husk which covers your emotional capabilities, so to speak, metaphorically. He will circumcise your heart. He will sensitize you and take away those things which have that husk of callousness, which is there for not allowed you to internalize things emotionally and react accordingly. That's the Vav Zarecha and your children's heart. And then, only then, you will truly love God then. With your whole focus and enthusiasm. With the whole essence of your life. For you realize that this is your life. This is the psukim we're talking about. This is the psukim we're describing promises of God that in Galut, when things are bad, we will somehow internalize our values. Ultimately, we will return at the end, and then God will bring us back, and he will actually take away our callousness, and we will attain the bliss of ultimate love in the God. It doesn't seem to say that there's a commandment here of returning to God. It's a prophecy that it will happen. And that's the way most of the um, medieval scholars interpret this. And that's how Rambam interprets this. 
Rama himself writes in the laws of Tshuva when he brings this Pasik, he calls it Haftacha Shiftichu Anavi'im. It's actually found in the 10th chapter of the laws of repentance. He calls this Pasik not a commandment, but a promise. Yes, it's a promise that one day we will all return to God. No, it's a long process. I still remember, you know, for goodness sakes, when I was a boy growing up in the 60s in America, did anybody dream that orthodoxy would rise and people would suddenly develop a religious consciousness and a movement towards coming back to their faith? We were sure that orthodoxy was on the way out. Oh, yeah. The neighborhood in Chicago, the conservative synagogues were busting and booming. Didn't have too many reforms there, but conservative was very popular. Even many of the Orthodox were somewhat called traditional. They had uh, gotten rid of the certain parts of the Orthodox practice in the show, the machitza, etc. for whatever reasons. It's not my place to judge or to describe. But at the end of the day, Orthodoxy was on the way out. And then God knows how and why this is not the place to talk such an upsurge, such a suddenly searching for God. The people came from all over, literally, you know, People in motion, like there used to be a song by Scott McKenzie, people all going to San Francisco, beautiful people with flowers in their hair. In Judaism, there was also true a certain movement of wanting to get close to God. Wow, it's a long time since then, and that movement is continuing in one way or the other. It all leads to the ultimate prophecy of the days that will come, Vishafta Sher Yashuv. Yes, you remnants of the Jews, you will all repent. And this is the prophecy here. It's a haftacha. But Nachmanides writes in his commentary to this pasuk of Vishafta Adashem Elokecha here in Deuteronomy 30, verse 2, that this is actually a mitzvah, a commandment to return to God with tshuva. Interesting to see that Ramon Taka does not codify as a commandment in his um, list of commandments, nor does he codify it in the Mishnah Torah as a commandment. No, he codifies that if and when you do tshuva, you must do it in a certain way of confession, etc. The style of how it's supposed to be done has been, has been legislated. But yet we don't find a commandment in the movement in Ramam of repenting. The language of the Rambam in Hechot Tshuva, laws of repentance in the first chapter, the first halacha is, kol mitzvot sheba Torah, all for, uh, positive commandments and all commandments in the Torah, bein asay, whether they are positive, uh, active commandments, bein lot asay, whether they are restrictive commandments, im avar adam alachatnem, should man have transgressed on either of them, bein bezadam, bein bezgaga, whether it was done with intent or by mistake, when he will repent, when he will repent, he will return from his sin. Then he writes the word, then he is obliged, that he must confess, in front of the Lord, blessed be he. There is no commandment for the tshuva it would seem to me that the tshuva is taken for granted. Now, what does that mean? Religion takes tshuva for granted. It only legislates, taken for granted, you're going to do it. This is the way you must do it. Can't elaborate this too much. This is not the forum. But let me try to explain what this really is. Um, Let's understand. If you look at the words carefully. The pasuk says, "Vishafta, and you will return, Ad Hashem Elokecha, until God, your Lord." You know, repentance. I was always taught to mean you are sorry and you you, you regret bad actions. And doing tshuva means to say, "I'm repenting from a sin." What does repenting to mean? Vishafta ad Hashem lekecha. Repenting to something. It doesn't mean repenting. It means returning. Returning ad Hashem lekecha. Now, what do those words mean? So here, you know, I'm an old sinner. 
you know, and for many years, I try to find out what makes me do these stupid things. You know, you have these feelings that every time, sometimes you do say, oops, that was stupid. And ultimately, all the small oopses get together. And Rosh Hashanah, you really do a big, oh, come on. Rav Nachman Taka writes that the hundred kolot, the hundred blowing of the trumpet of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, they're an accumulation of all the oops you did all year. All the small regrets after you did it, they come together. You know what it is. You start looking at what you did and say, this, is, this was really stupid. And you're making some commitment. I'm going to try to live with sense. And that's the blowing of the chauffeur, remembering your mistakes, remembering the oops, that was stupid. So the other question is, what exactly is the stupidity that people, it forces them to sin? Or why is it so hard to do tshuva? Why is it so hard to do tshuva? I mean, we do believe in God. We do believe that uh, God realizes what we do, what we think, what we say. He even records it. It's almost like a, uh, like a, like a, Hooverian nightmare, like, you know what I mean? Like a big brother. <laughs> He's everywhere. He knows what you're doing. He knows what you're saying. He knows what you're thinking. Yet you will do and say in front of God what you wouldn't do in front of your mother. How does that work? Do you believe in this God or don't you believe in this God? Do you believe that God, I and I sees Ozen Shemat and the ears here? and everything you do is recorded? You do believe it. Ooh, you did Pirkei Avot. And yet you do it. Do you think he's busy writing tickets on 42nd Street? Uh, or he's a Irish police cop and therefore he's busy in a pub on Tuesday evening? It's like, uh, how does this work? How does this work? If we would know what causes us to sin, we would know what to fix. Working on symptoms without dealing with the major reason behind it may be short-term relief. Doesn't really provide the possibilities for true success. Sometimes I think that the... from people don't really do tshuva. They, we pay lip service to it. But we're not doing it because I think we're missing the mark. I think we're missing the mark. You see, the Pasik says, Vishafta ad Yudke Vavke Elokecha. You will return in front of Yudke Vavke Elokecha. Yudke Vavke, your Lord. Now, what exactly does that mean? So let me start with one thing, and that is as follows. In the book of Mitzvot, recorded the Rambam, my mind, he has a book of mitzvot which records all the 613 mitzvot that were given to Moses at Sinai. And there's a, interestingly enough, he does not mention the first, he mentions the first mitzvah as Anochi Hashem Alokacha. I am God, your Lord, that took you out of Egypt. He sees that as a mitzvah. To know that, to understand that, to internalize that. Ramban brings that the earlier Ga'onim people that preceded Ramban felt this was not a mitzvah, rather this was that which is needed in order to have a mitzvah. First believe there's a king and a creator, and then he will you know, think by yourself to believe, to accept his decrees. Well, I think they're both true. But let's try to understand what the words mean. Anochi, it is I. Yudke vavke, which we call God. Elokecha, your Lord. Nachmanides in his commentary to Chumash on that says as follows. In Parshat Yitro, which is in Exodus, at the beginning of Matan Torah, we have over there the Ramban in um, chapter 20, verse 2. Anochi, it is I, Hashem Elokecha, I am Yudke Vavke, which is your Lord. He writes as follows, this statement is a positive commandment. Amar, God said, Anochi, he introduced himself. Listen carefully, it is I, which is Yudke. What does that mean? Yore, he teaches, and he commands, that they must know, 
No, the Aminu, and they must believe. What is knowing and believing? Well, let's start with that. You know, believing means to say, basically you accept a certain truth as axiomatic for many reasons, you, without thinking about it, within, you accept it as a fact. You accept it as something which you, uh, which you live with. I definitely believe somehow out of nowhere that the statistics are that the airplane pilot, which will take, which will fly my plane, was not drunk and will not drive my car, my plane into a, into a mountain ridge. Happens. Well, did I at least check the statistics to see whether it's true or not? Do I know the blood, the alcohol level of the blood in the blood of certain pilots? Well, have I even bothered to check the statistics? No, we don't bother. No one bothers to accept certain things because that would basically curb their comfort level. You could not live and survive, or rather you couldn't thrive if you constantly had to prove that the wheel is round. Why do you trust your doctor? Did you even check his diploma? Do you know the rate of people cheating in certain schools? Who knows what? We are forced to trust things because in order to preserve our comfort zones, for whatever those comfort zones are, we trust them totally. I drive on. You eat food in restaurants. You take medicine. Did anybody bother reading those? Horrendous pieces of paper in the medicine box saying, if you eat, if you take this, God knows what can happen to you. You just do me a favor, throw it away and go further. Do you ever buy software on the computer? Like, what do you do? They send you like a Megillat Esther of information, which you don't bother reading. You scroll at the bottom, check it and go. For goodness sakes. For all you know, you just mortgage your house. No, no. You trust things. Blindly. You trust things, you endanger your, your, your health, wealth, and security. You trust them. We all trust things. That's called faith. It's not something which we have, uh, which we understand, internalize, that we live with, we depend upon. And then this called knowledge. Knowledge is something that you basically have internalized to make it real and vivid. You know, I believe that um, drinking Coca-Cola is not healthy for me. We still do it. I believe that eating French fries is not healthy for me. I still do it. But I know that smoking is dangerous, so I stopped. I believe that speeding is dangerous, therefore we continue speeding. But you know that COVID uh, is not exactly good for your health. You're all going to walk around with masks or whatever it be. To the extent that you've internalized it, it's become vivid and real to you, you have a healthy emotional reaction and you live with it totally. To the extent that it's only belief, it's a bit selective. You accept it, the acceptance is needed, but you know what? Yes, no. We have many beliefs which have not become knowledge, they've not become internalized. I believe, you know what I believe, like, you know, in the Christian art, Iconic art, the belief is like a light hovering above the head. It's not been brought into me. It's something I depend on from above. Judaism needs the light to come into your face, and your face must radiate with that light as they radiate with Moshe, Koran or Pana. The ideas have to become internalized and become part of who you are until you and your contents radiate with them. Ramban says here, Anochi Hashem Elokechi, you have to do Emuna, but you also need Yediyah. You have to internalize this. To work very hard and internalize this is a vivid, real truth. Kiyesh Elokechem, there is a God, Vuhu Elohim Lahem, and He is their Lord. Klomar, what does Yudke Vavke mean, the Ramban says? Hovek Hatmon, the primary existent and source of existence of all. All that comes and is, is only from the primary existent called God. It's with his will, with his omnipotence. That is God. When you talk about Yud Kevavka, I believe that he, there is a primary existent, that all of existence, all finite existence period, is an expression of his will and his omnipotence. That's what I believe. I believe when I look at a, uh, the laws of science, 
when I go to uh, Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe, in, in, in Africa, and I see the wonders of nature, I put my eyes into my telescope or my microscope. I see the complexities of, and beauty of reality. And I say all this an expression of his will, his wisdom and his, uh, 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 and his capabilities, which he has expressed his infinite self in these finite forms. That's number one, I believe in. Ultimately, the world is his and the agenda is his, for also I am that form which is created by him. And thus he is my Lord, because I realize I'm nothing more than an extension of his ego, will, etc. I am obliged by knowing this truth that he is the source of it all, and creation is an expression of his will. Ultimately, the goal of creation is the expression of his will. And I am here, I have been created to facilitate that will. Thus, I am obliged by the nature of my identity to be enslaved to him, in servitude to him. La vodoto. Then he writes the show to Ticha Me'eretz Mitzrayim, and he elaborates and explains because during the 10 plagues in Egypt, God reintroduced his monotheism to the world and showed how he is the creator, he is the leader, he manipulates, he changes, and he leads us into history. This is Anaychi Hashem Elokecha. So Bahag, the Gaonim thought, this is something that we know, certain things we know because we know our history. We don't have to command things on the obvious. That knowledge is the reason why now we must listen to his, uh, to his laws and his commandments. Why listen to God? Because you have no existence outside of him. Because all you are is a, an Im a projection of his image. The whole creation is nothing more than his idea, which he has a purpose for, which he wants to lead it to a certain place. And we've been here to facilitate that will. That's the only way I can describe myself. Ultimately, I'm going to do it. The truth is what pushes me. What obliges me to do the mitzvahs is the truth of Anarchy Hashem Elokech. Rambam believes, and Ramban also believes, it's also a commandment. It's a commandment to do what it takes, not just to believe this, not just to accept a certain philosophical doctrine, but to totally depend and put your life on it and to internalize it, move it from cerebral intelligence to your emotional intelligence, from your chachma to your dot, from just being a halo or in, or in late irradiating face into internalizing into your persona, being a radiating person. That is anoichi Hashem alokecha. You know why we sin? Because we haven't internalized that. We believe in God. We don't know he's there. Oh, my, my mom's around, I know. <laughs> With God, I believe. Yeah, I'll give you a little anecdote. When I was a child, um, for four years of my very young life, 11, 12, 13, and 14, I was sent to high school from Chicago, the nice, normal city of Chicago, to Brooklyn, New York, to go to a high school. It was in the Bedford-Stuyvesant area of Brooklyn. Not a very, very, well, now it's actually somehow, I think, it's being gentrified. It was a pretty bad neighborhood, to say the least. That was the year I still remember that uh, there were two great baseball players for the New York Yankees called Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle. Levrach, if I may say, and they were there was a race between them who would break the 60 home run hits in the season, which was set by Babe Ruth. So you can imagine that the Sunday papers, obviously, or whatever it be, the papers in the Daily News at the time. In the back page, like it was full of this. Who did, is it? Mantle? Is it Maris? Is it Maris? Is it Mantle? A block away from the yeshiva that I was in, there was a newsstand. So I used to go over to the newsstand. And every day, you know, it didn't couldn't care us about the paper. When you're an 11 year boy, you turn it around to the sports page. Did Maris do it? Did Mantle do it? This was a big thing in those days. 
Well, then right next to the church was something which is very typical of the, uh, of the Afro-American ghettos of Brooklyn at the time. And that is a Pentecostal church, very charismatic. Now remember, I come from a nice, normal, you know, Chicago, never had Pentecostal churches in our neighborhood. Didn't exist. Um, I hardly ever saw Afro-Americans at the time. They were, they were turned around. It was in the other southwest side of Chicago. Uh, the north side was something a bit more waspy. You know, and I, I and I used to listen to the prayers in that Pentecostal church. I used to hear them say, I believe, I believe. And I was really taken. I said, I said, love this davening. I really do. The emotional fervor the, and the singing. And the, you know, I hate to say it, it was, it was a very chesidish prayer session. Very beautiful. It was, it was taken. I always felt, why don't we have that? Why are we so enthused and infused? It's unbelievable. It's like, oh, it was a beautiful happening. And they really believe. You felt, well, they believe. I wish I could get up and show and say, I believe. And it bothered me. I was a little boy, a nice little 11 year old kid. But then I noticed that across the street from, the, um, from their stable, from the church, we would call the Kiddush Hall, the uh, saloon, the bar. Well, they went in for their kiddush after their prayers, and somehow they didn't walk out until Monday morning, man. <laughs> and then I suddenly realized, this is a realization of a young, curious, 11-year-old boy. You can say, I believe from today to tomorrow and sing the most beautiful way. But then you go to your bar, and you're there till Monday morning, and you're not exactly behaving in the most appropriate way. I'm not going to describe the lifestyle of Bedford Stuyvesant. It's not enough to believe. You have to internalize. You have to know as much as you can, internalize it, move it, as I said, from the heart head to the heart, widen out your neck to allow it to flow, to flow down as you become vivid and real. You know what the mitzvah of Vavtat Hashem Lokecha means? That in light of after you realize that you said that Yud Shema Yisrael, Yud Ke Vavke Elokeinu, you say, you know what that is? It means that you must love him so much because you internalize this so deeply that life is meaningless without him. You can't live if living is without you. And thus, if someone will tell me, deny his existence, if not, I will kill you, you will stretch your neck out because I can't live if living is without you. The commandment is to internalize the information of Hashem Elukeinu, Hashem Echad, so profoundly and deeply that the natural reaction to a decree of avodah zarah, idolatry, or death will say, sorry, my name is Juliet. I cannot live without Romeo. And you will give your life. There's no commandment there, get yourself killed. The commandment is internalize what you just said and love him so deeply that life would not be an option. So when we talk about um, why we do Averis, it's very simple. Because the reason for doing mitzvahs has not really been internalized. At the best, it's faith. It's not Yediyah. We are fulfilling the Yaminu. We're not doing the Viedu of the Ramban. We're not informed. We don't bother to learn it in depth until it's internalized and becomes real to us. We don't do what it takes to internalize our information, to transform it into emotional intelligence. A lot of different techniques for that, but this is not the form to deal with it, but that's the goal. The Gemara says a person sins because he's... Um, he becomes a bit, uh, he's foolish. Ain't Adam chote, man does not sin. Elim came, nichnas baruch shtut. He somehow, some, some spirit of foolishness enters him. And where do we learn it from? We learn it from the Pasuk, which describes the wayward wife, which is engaging in an adulterous relationship. And it's called, Hitiste ishtai. she acts as a fool, the sota. That's with a shin, by the way, not with the samach. She's sure that no one sees. 
She's sure she's going to get away with it. No, 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 no. You're seen. We think that no one sees. We think. Don't you believe? Yes, I believe that he's here. I don't feel he's here. I lack basic understanding and the knowledge of Anoichi Hashem Elokecha. You know what commands us to do tshuva? Not the, 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 that which commands us to constantly believe and know that we are in the presence of God. And that he is our creator and the world is his and the agenda is his. And by walking away from him, we are undermining our, our identity, our purpose, and by not realizing that everything we do is important to him, and we are so important to him, we are undermining our basic existence. For he sees, he is here. He doesn't have to come from afar. He doesn't have to cross the street. He's with you, constantly with you. If you would internalize it, it would feel so good. It would feel great. You know, um, Again, in the draft boards of the 60s, so you used to have a picture of uh, Uncle Sam with the funny hat and the beard, goatee. Uncle Sam wants you to go to Vietnam. Well, I once got something like that. Students of mine made a collage, a, a rather a some kind of a Photoshop thing of um, just a finger without a face. And it says, God wants you. And that's the truth. That's what Anokhi Hashem Elokecha means. No, not just believe that I, God says, and the primary existence from which everything comes, and ultimately, therefore, you are in my service. That says we will do tshuva. That's why the world will do tshuva, because the world will ultimately fulfill God's purpose. And we are commanded to do tshuva because it's a truth. Because if we are to identify ourselves as what we really are, that Hashem you obviously are going to do tshuva. So even if that wouldn't be a commandment, it would be a truth which is binding and the truth which is the source of all everything else. So now you know that although Maimonides does not see in the Pasuk a mitzvah of doing tshuva, it's more than a mitzvah. It's the fundamental idea which is the source of all mitzvahs. Anochi Hashem Elokecha. Ultimately, when we walked away from God, we did sin, what was our problem? We walked away from Hashem Elokecha. We walked away from the idea and the thinking that he is the primary existent, and the source of all, and thus he is my Lord. And that's where you're allowed to make ourselves our own subjective, feelings and practices of Judaism. We've decided to rewrite his book. We, we forgot for one minute that we're, the world is his and we're pawns on his board. We cut him out of our minds and we live a life as if the world is ours and we are deciding the agenda. So the Pasuk says, you know what Shuva is? You must go back to stand in the presence of Yudke Vavke, Ove Kadmon, Shimimeno Akol Bechevis Viacholet, the ultimate absolute existence that is the source of all expression of his will and of his capabilities, Elokecha, and thus he is your Lord. You go back to that. You've dealt with the core issue, not just with symptoms. Tshuva does not mean repent. It means return. Return to where you belong, Jojo. We belong standing in front of God. We turned our backs to him because we never internalize this with Yidia. We suffice it with, we said, we were happy with Emuna. And that's not enough. Emuna allows inconsistency of behavior. Yidia doesn't. I repeat, I stopped smoking years, years, 30 years ago, because I suddenly realized and saw vividly what it does to me. If I had the same understanding about other things, I would probably be a much healthier person today. 
Now, the other things I believe, so to speak, it did not become yidia. And that's why I transgress. If you want to grow in religion, you must learn how to internalize the knowledge. You must be informed. There is so much to learn and understand about this God. I assure you, the more you learn astronomy, botanics, or whatever it only be, and you realize the complexities of creation of science, and then you realize all oh, this is nothing more than an expression of an infinite God, you stand in crazy awe. The more you do that, the more you're informed about everything. It helps you internalize things, yes. When I you know, put my eyes into a telescope and I, I look far and I suddenly realize the small kernel of nothing, which is Earth compared to the vast cosmos, in my mind pops up, Ma Rabu Ma Secha Hashem, how great are your creations, God. They're full of your knowledge. The, the complexity of reality is unbelievably the complexity which is found in your infinite self. Why? I want to get to know you more. Please let me know you. Pray for knowing him. Pray for engaging in deep thought and learning. Whatever it takes. Whatever discipline it takes. In order to know and internalize those values. So we pray to God and we say, please, there's so many things stopping us from seeing this. Our comfort zones. <laughs> if I start honestly searching in a religious quest, it will disrupt my comfort zone. And most people don't want to do that. So you pray to God, please take away those things which stop me from knowing you and your way. I'm going to read you Rambam. Maimonides in the sixth chapter of Tshuva, the fourth halacha. Ubiyan zeh, this, in this type of thing, shalim anavi'im v'atzadikim tzulotayim, righteous people and prophets ask God in their prayers, the azram, to help them el derech ha'emet, they should find the true path. Kamosham ar David, as our King David said, horeni Hashem darchecha, it's a pasuk in Tehilim 25, Teach me, God, your ways. Klomar, what does that mean? Go learn yourself. No, al yimneini chata'ai. Lest my past sins, which have caused insensitivities, callousness, a comfort zone, these will all stop me. They won't allow me to go to serious religious quest. Because if I will go to religious quest, I will know your ways. I understand the uniqueness of what it means in absolute God. That, he says, please, please, please take away those things which stop me from being honest with myself and searching for knowing you. Let my inner will let me really do what I really want to do. Lest my sins will stop me. My comfort zone will stop me from realizing what I really want to do. And that's be religiously honest. Intellectually honest with my God. Let me have my own free will to control myself. Until I finally will stand in front of you and come back. I will understand. And I will internalize. These are the psukim when we say hashivenu avinu l'seira secha. God, there may not be a mitzvah of tshuva, but it's a basic Jewish fundamental idea which is obligatory for it's the truth. But there's so many things stopping me from knowing that. There's so many things that don't want to let me be honest even in my search for knowledge and taking it for real. No. Bring us back to your teachings. Help us. Help us go back to your real learning. To really being honest in our learning in order to understand and to know. Ultimately, therefore, once we've got the core, once we will internalize Anoichi Hashem Elokecha, the Karveno Malkeno Lavodasecha, 
then this will bring me back to my sense of servitude. All this is for one thing. Bring us back with the total return of body and soul, cerebral and emotional, to stand in front of you. And we will be in front of you. We will then fulfill Anaychi Hashem Elokecha. We will then fulfill the first sip in Shulchan Aruch. Shivisi Hashem. I see God, place Him, the Negdi in front of me, Tamid, forever and perpetually. Thank you for listening. I hope this will have an effect because um, God should help. We should be my recovered Shemai. We should enhance the glory and awareness of God in this world. I once again want to thank and appreciate your beautiful community. It's uh, the memories are unbelievable and it's just so beautiful to think about it and to know that such a beautiful program is happening where people really want to learn what they're saying and what they're davening. Have a great day, afternoon, evening, wherever it is. Take care.